Cocking in the New Land Story, Story Overview. In this story, you will meet Edite Kunha when she was seven years old. Edite came to the United States from Portugal. On the first day at her new school, the teacher changed Edite's name. Here is the story. No one was as stubborn as Pa. Before I started school in America, I was Edite. Maria Edite Dos Anjos Kunha. I loved my name. I'd say Maria Edite Dos Anjos Kunha whenever I could. My name was musical and beautiful, and through it I knew exactly who I was. When I was seven, we moved from our little house in Sabra, Portugal, to Peabody, Massachusetts. I was in America for about a week when, one morning, someone took me to school and handed me over to the teacher, Mrs. Donahue. Mrs. Donahue spoke Portuguese, an amazing thing, I thought, or to a woman with such a funny name, one so difficult to pronounce. Como e queti chamas. She asked me as she led me to a desk by a big window. Maria Edite Dos Anjos Cunha, I recited, staring at Mrs. Donahue, as I wondered how a woman with that name could speak my language. In fact, Mrs. Donahue was Portuguese. She was a Silva, but she had married a man named Donahue and had changed her name. She changed my name, too, on the first day of school. Your name will be Mary Edith Cunha, she announced. In America, you need only two or three names. Mary Edith is a lovely name, and it will be easier to pronounce. My name was Edict. Maria Edict. Maria Edict Dos Anjos Cunha. I had no trouble pronouncing it. Mary Edith, Edit, Mary Edit, Mrs. Donahue said. She wrinkled up her nose and raised her upper lip to show me the proper place to put the tongue to make the TH sound. She looked hideous and there was a big pain in my head. I wanted to scream out my real name, but I knew I couldn't argue with her. At home I cried and cried. Ma and Pa wanted to know about my day at school. I tried to explain, but I couldn't pronounce the new name for them. Day after day, Mrs. Donahue made me practice pronouncing the name that wasn't mine. Mary Edit. Mary Edit. Mary Edit. Weeks later, I still wouldn't respond when she called it out in class. She was a tiny woman, Mrs. Donahue, not much bigger than I was. Her gray hair was always cut short, and she wore a smile on her face almost every day. It was not a big, broad smile. It was hardly visible, but it was there in her eyes and at the corners of her mouth. She usually wore suits with jackets neatly fitted at the waist. The shoes matched each other, but they were not identical. One of them had a very thick sole because one of Mrs. Donahue's legs was shorter than the other. I grew to love Mrs. Donahue, and she helped me learn English. She was the only teacher at school who danced with us. She thought that it was important to dance. Every day after recess, she took us all to the big open space at the back of the room. We stood in a circle and joined hands. Mrs. Donahue would hum a high note, and we became a twirling, singing wheel. Mrs. Donahue hobbled on her short leg and sang out, Here we go, loop the loop. We took three steps, then a pause. Her last loop was always very high. It seemed to squeak above our heads, bouncing on the ceiling. Here we go, loop to lie. Three more steps, another pause, and on we whirled. Here we go, loop to loop. Pause, all on a steady night. To anyone looking in from the corridor, we were surely a very interesting sight. A circle of children of different sizes and colors singing and twirling with our tiny hobbling teacher. When I was nine, Pa went to an auction and bought a big house on Tremont Street. We moved in the spring. The lawn of the side of the house dipped downward in a gentle slope and was covered with a thick, dense row of tall lilac bushes. I soon discovered that I could crawl between the bushes and hide from my brothers in the fragrant, sweet-smelling shade. It was paradise. I was mostly wild and joyful on Tremont Street. But now and then there was a shadow that fell over my days. Oh, idiot, idiot. Since Pa didn't speak English very well, he always called me, without the least bit of warning, to be his voice. He expected me to drop whatever I was doing to take care of something. Pa never called my brother Carlos. No, Carlos never had to do anything but play. Recently, I'd had to talk on the telephone to a woman who wanted some old dishes. The dishes, along with a lot of old furniture and junk, had been in the house when we moved in. They were in the cellar, stacked in cardboard boxes and covered with dust. The woman called many times, wanting to speak with Pa. My father can't speak English, I would say. He says to tell you that the dishes are in our house and they belong to us. But she did not seem to understand. Every few days she would call. Oh, Eddie Eight. Pa's voice echoed through the empty rooms. I wanted to pretend I had not heard it when it had that tone. But I couldn't escape. I couldn't disappear into thin air as I wished to do at such times. Eddie Eight. Yes, that tone was certainly there. Pa was calling me to do something only I could do. What was it now? Did I have to talk to the insurance company? They were always using words I couldn't understand. Premium and dividend. That made me nervous. Please wait. I called my daughter, Pa was saying. He was talking to someone, someone in the house. Who could it be? Oh, Eddie Eight. Quay you. 
Come over here and talk to this lady. Reluctantly, I walked through the empty rooms toward the kitchen. Through the kitchen door, I could see a slim lady dressed in brown standing at the top of the stairs. She had on high-heeled shoes and was holding a brown purse. As soon as Pa saw me, he said to me, See what she wants. The lady had dark hair that was very smooth. The ends of it flipped up in a way that I liked. Hello, I'm the lady who called about the dishes. I stared at her without a word. My stomach turned over. What did she say? Pa wanted to know. She says she's the lady who wants the dishes. Pa's face hardened some. Tell her she's wasting her time. We're not giving them to her. Did you already tell her that on the telephone? I nodded, standing helplessly between them. Well, tell her again. Pa was getting angry. I want it to disappear. My father says he can't give you the dishes, I said to the lady. She clutched her purse and leaned a little forward. Yes, you told me that on the phone. But I wanted to come in person and speak with your father because it's very important to me that. My father can't speak English, I interrupted her. Why didn't she just go away? Yes, I understand that. But I wanted to see him. She looked at Pa, who was standing in the doorway to the kitchen holding his hammer. The kitchen was up one step from the porch. Pa was a small man, but he looked kind of scary staring down at us like that. What is she saying? She says she wanted to talk to you about getting her dishes. Tell her the dishes are ours. They were in the house. We bought the house and everything in it. Tell her the lawyer said so. A lady was looking at me hopefully. My father says the dishes are ours because we bought the house and the lawyer said everything in the house is ours now. Yes, I know that, but I was away when the house was being sold. I didn't know. There were footsteps on the stairs behind her. It was Ma coming up from the second floor to find out what was going on. The lady moved away from the door to let Ma in. This is my wife, Pa said to the lady. The lady said hello to Ma, who smiled and nodded her head. She looked at me, then at Pa in a questioning way. It's the lady who wants our dishes, Pa explained. Ma looked at her again and smiled, but I could tell she was a little worried. We stood there in kind of a funny circle. The lady looked at each of us in turn and took a deep breath. I didn't know, she continued, that the dishes were in the house. I was away. They are very important to me. They belong to my grandmother. I'd really like to get them back. She spoke this while looking back and forth between Ma and Pa. Then she looked down at me, leaning forward again. Well, tell you your parents, please. I spoke in a hurry to get the words out. She said she didn't know the dishes were in the house because she was away. They were her grandmother's dishes, and she wants them back. I felt deep sorrow at the thought of the lady returning home to find her grandmother's dishes sold. We don't need all those dishes. Let's give them to her, Ma said in her calm way. I felt relieved. We could give the lady the dishes and she would go away. But Pa got angry. I already said what I had to say. The dishes are ours. That is all. Pa, she said she didn't know. They were her grandmother's dishes. She needs to have them. I was speaking wildly and loud now. The lady looked at me questioningly, but I didn't want to speak to her again. She's only saying that to trick us. If she wanted those dishes, she should have taken them out before the house was sold. Tell her we are not fools. Tell her to forget it. She can go away. Tell her not to call or come here again. What is he saying? The lady was looking at me again. I ignored her. I felt sorry for Pa for always feeling that people were trying to trick him. I wanted him to trust people. I wanted the lady to have her grandmother's dishes. I closed my eyes and willed myself away. Tell her what I said. Pa yelled. Pa, just give her the dishes. They were her grandmother's dishes. My voice cracked as I yelled back at him. Tears were rising in my eyes. I hated Pa for being so stubborn. I hated the lady for not taking the dishes before the house was sold. And I hated myself because I had to tell her that she couldn't give her grandmother's dishes.